afternoon and yeah, thanks to Brexpats for inviting me to be involved in this event. Um, as Richard said, my name is Sarah and I'm the Vice Consul in the British Consulate in Alicante. So cover the whole of the Valencia region and the Morthia region. Um, just before we start taking questions, I want to just mention quickly about the TIE card, which was introduced last week. That's the new photo ID that British nationals can apply for. Just want to make absolutely clear that if you are in possession of a green certificate or a or or credit card size um, green residency document, you do not have to change this for a TIE card, but you can do so if you wish to. The green document will remain valid and guarantees your rights under the withdrawal agreement whilst you remain living in Spain. All new applicants will now go through a two-step process whereby they will apply first to the foreigners office and then they will get a TIE card. New applicants do have to get a TIE card, they can no longer get a green document but the requirements have not changed. So you still are treated as an EU national in terms of requirements, not as a third country national until the end of this year, which is the end of the transition period. Our website, which is gov.uk forward slash living in Spain, will be updated over the next few days to include all of the information about how to apply for the TIE and the new um, and residency as, as a new applicant, um, and also include links to the Spanish frequently asked questions. But at the moment, all of the information is also on our Facebook page, which is facebook.com forward slash Brits in Spain. And I'm very happy to answer any questions that I can help with. Thank you. Microphone, Richard. Richard, your microphone. Sorry, my space bar wasn't working. Ignacio, do you wish to say something? No, no, the microphone was not working. I just was trying to say. Right, I'm going to move straight into this because I already have a, a, a quite a massive list of questions. So let's get straight into it. Uh, from Lewis, my husband and I have certificados de registro de criando de la Union Europa dating from January 2019. In other words, what is commonly known as the residency. We decided we did not want to be tax resident in Spain during 2019 and only spent five months in Spain. However, we still have the green certificate. We returned to Spain in 2020, but only spent January and February in Spain and have been in the UK since March because of the pandemic. We intend to return to Spain in October 2020, so we will only spend five months again in Spain this year. They have uh, a number of questions by the look of it. As we will have spent more than six months out of Spain, will our green cards have lost their validity? I'll put that over to you quickly, Sarah, to answer that one. Right, so, yeah, I would advise you when you get to Spain to apply for the TIE card to make sure that you are still counted as a resident because you can lose the status if you are out of the country for more than six months, particularly as you've not been resident for very long. So in your case, if you plan to remain in Spain and want to be under the withdrawal agreement, I would advise you to apply for the, for the TIE card swap to make sure that they um, recognise that you're still living here. Thank you, Sarah. Next one is for you, Ignacio. If we exchanged our green card for the new TIE, I believe that the TIE would be dated from the date of issue of the green card, January 2019. Would that imply that we were tax resident from mm. 2019? Right, okay. It is a, it's an important question because actually um, there is an evidence that you've got a residency card, but I will suggest them to make sure they get a fiscal certificate in the UK uh, to confirm that they are tax resident in the UK according to the Double Taxation Treaty. So if they spend less than six months in Spain, even though they had their residencia, even tax office could think as an evidence that they're being resident in Spain. So the burden of proof is for them to prove if they ever receive a letter by the tax office that they were not. So my recommendations, keep your flight tickets, uh, get yourself a certificate from the UK saying, according to the double taxation between England, uh, UK and Spain, 
you are tax raising in the UK. And then if you ever receive a letter from it, uh, then you always have the, the, the right evidence to say, I'm sorry, I've got the residency card, but I'm not tax resident because of these reasons. But is, is a delicate uh, issue here, uh, Richard. Okay, thank you, Ignacio. Uh, from Fiona, uh, I have form EX20 from Citizens Advice in Spain. Don't quite understand that. Can I go to foreigners' office with it in person, as I don't want to submit online? The online digital certificate process is unfathomable. I believe the answer is no, but I'll pass it round to Sarah. <clears throat> Uh, no, the, you can apply in person if you want to, but you have to book an appointment. Um, so you go onto the online appointment booking system and book an appointment. Um, and um, you have to select, I'm just looking up the option, just one second. Uh, you have to ex uh, select Trámite para la Documentación de Nacionales de Reino Unido, brackets Brexit. Okay, really important. The frequently asked questions document issued by the Spanish authorities is in English and in Spanish. Brexpats have shared it on their website, we've shared it on our Facebook. The instructions are there about exactly what you would do in each scenario. So read those through and I'm sure you'll find that you, you know what you need to do next. Okay, but you've got the right form um, and you can apply in person, but you need to book an appointment. Yeah, she goes on to say, uh, Sarah, that um, can she phone the foreigner's office to make an appointment to take the EX20? Because she can't okay. get an appointment online. There is no drop down option to do this. Yes, yeah, uh, so uh, I suppose it depends what area. The appointments are opening up. Bearing in mind, this system only got, got moving last week. So the appointments for the handing in of documents are opening up across provinces gradually. So if she can't see anything in the area that she's in, she can continue to look. Bear in mind, although obviously pe people can do this on their own, there's no need to pay someone to do so. But if they wish to, they can employ a lawyer, a gestor, or a colegial, or a graduado social, who is on the online portal and can submit the documents for them so they don't have to worry about the digital certificate. So if you choose, obviously it's not obligatory to pay someone to help you, but if you wish to pay someone, please do find someone who has access to the online portal so that you're spared that journey in Talicante. Thanks ever so much, Sarah. Uh, moving on, next question. Uh, this is for you, Sophie. Who is responsible for obtaining a habitation certificate for a property, the seller or the buyer? Thank you. Um, okay, so here, when we list the property, we always check the documentation at the time of listing to ensure that all the paperwork is in place. And we would say that it is the vendor's responsibility to have the habitation license in place so that when a buyer comes along, there isn't any issues. Brilliant, thank you for that. Um, moving on again, sorry about this. I, I know I'm rushing things, but with all these questions in, there's not a lot of choice. Um, uh, is there an English version of the EX20 and EX23? Sarah? No, no, there is not an English version, but they're fairly straightforward forms to fill in. Um, and I mean, I know this may sound obvious, but I do find Google Translate does actually help sometimes, you know, if it's a simple thing. Um, what is in English is the frequently asked questions from the Spanish authorities. And that does explain quite clearly a lot of different things. Yeah, unfortunately, not in English. The EX20 is actually fairly self-explanatory, I found when I looked at it. Um, what documentation do we need to show we fall within the scope of the withdrawal agreement? Is the notice simply and house deeds sufficient? I don't know who wants to pick that one up. Sarah, go ahead. Right, so the thing you need to prove that you're in the scope of the withdrawal agreement is that you're living legally in Spain before the end of this year. You can show that with a green residency certificate or card or with a TIE. If by the end of this year you don't have any of those things, but you are living in Spain, you can still fall within the scope of the withdrawal agreement if you show that you are self-sufficient in Spain by having sufficient income and proper healthcare cover. So one of the things that could contribute to that would be, for example, owning your property, having a regular income, having savings, etc. Um, but having a property in itself would not guarantee that you're under the scope of the withdrawal agreement. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, Ignacio, Michael, do you wish to comment on that? Um, Richard, what I would like to do perhaps is, uh, can I ask Sarah a question? 
Well, can, can we deal with the people's questions first, and then? Okay, when you're ready, yeah, you're ready. Let me otherwise, ask I won't get through them, okay. Michael. Uh, no problem. Don't worry. Uh, um, uh, do we need? Uh, will uh, Will a letter from our financial advisor be suitable to say we have sufficient to funds to live off, as opposed to having a load of money sitting in the bank? Uh, who wants to pick it up? Uh, Ignacio, go ahead. Sorry, would you like to pick it up? Oh, yeah? go ahead, sir. Oh. Right, well, I, actually, uh, as far as I know, um, um, I think it will be as simple as certifying in the bank, Spanish bank, because the money, as far as um, I know, it needs to be in the Spanish bank. I know different different police stations have been having different criteria. Oh, I would like to comment. But uh, basically, the money needs to be in the bank, and you need a certificate from the bank saying that you have that money during three months, and you've been living in Spain, having direct debits in the in the account. So you could prove you're really being living in Spain. Is that correct, Sarah? Right. Just what, just one thing I would add to that is that the new the process for new applicants is being handled by the foreigners department, not by the police. So we may see some changes in the way they look at the documentation and there may be a bit more flexibility. I would imagine that a letter from a financial advisor in the UK would not necessarily be recognized, but you may find that the, um, the kind of the strict requirement of that money being in a Spanish bank account and having sat there for three months may be um, less, less of an obligation um, and there may be more flexibility. My advice is that people present what they have show an honest picture of what they are have in terms of living in Spain, and then they will get feedback on that if it's not sufficient. Brilliant, thank you very much. So basically the answer to the question is probably a just a note from the financial advisor is not gonna, not gonna cut the ice. Um, do we need a TIE before applying for a Spanish driving license? Or is a padron, no to simply, house deeds enough? who um again sarah go ahead i don't know why i keep muting right uh, you need either a green residency certificate a green residency card or a tie before you can swap your driving license okay simple answer um uh, does residencia this is from dave does residencia require health care with no exclusions as well as no copay. I think this one obviously is yours, Martin. Yeah, thank you. I'm not quite sure what the, the question means by no copay, something to do with co-payments, but in terms of the health insurance cover, uh, it has to be at the same level as state health cover, so it has to be complete and cover every treatment. So if you have pre-existing conditions, um, you'd have to very carefully check any private insurance cover you have or you need take out to make sure that um, you're covered for those treatments as well. Um, another option for people who've been here for a year and have been here on the Padron for a year is they can join the state government scheme called the Convenio Especial, which costs people under 65, 60 euros a month. And that would be sufficient health insurance for the coroner's office to award you residency. Thanks, Martin. Uh, from Nikki, I'm hoping to finish my residency uh, in the next month. If I am successful, can you confirm that my husband will be able to join me in Spain at a later date and that he will have the rights under the withdrawal agreement, even though he may join me after the working agreement transition period, because I will hopefully have residency. Um, who will? Again, Sarah, go ahead. Yeah, so that is correct. Close family members have the, re have the right to join people under the withdrawal agreement, under the current rules, as long as the relationship existed before the end of December this year, and also for any future children who may be born. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I'll answer this one very quickly. Is there any news on dual nationality? No, there isn't. Um, it's as simple as that. Um, uh, my husband, this is from Nikki, my husband has a pan-EU job. Uh, one assumes that means he travels uh, across, across Europe. That is based in the UK. Can he work from Spain as a resident, but still be paid from and in the UK? Ooh. 
Mm. Uh, Michael, do you want to answer that one? Sorry, I was looking at something else. Sorry, Richard, I was, I was out of it at that moment. Let, let somebody else okay, uh, Sarah, you put your hand up. Yeah, I mean, I can give it a go. Um, I think there's there's a difference here between whether he's a frontier worker or a posted worker. So if he lives in Spain and regularly travels to the UK to work, then he could be classed as a frontier worker, resident in Spain, and yes, could be covered by the withdrawal agreement. But if he's specifically in the UK, sorry, in Spain and moves to the UK or the other way around for a period of time, then not necessarily. So it may be one, I don't know whether to, to write in a bit with more detail, um, contact the her, or, or contact you know the Her Majesty Revenue and Customs or the International Pension Centre because a lot of it will depend on the healthcare cover as well I imagine. Thank you very much, Martin. Just to add to that, there is another option if if this customer is actually working for the UK via the internet um, from Spain, um, that situation can get quite complicated. So actually, as Sarah said, they really need to write into us very quickly because we need to liaise with HMRC. Um, in order to make sure that that customer situation is properly regularised before the end of the transition period. Brilliant, thank you, Martin. Michael, did you want to comment on this? No, I agree with everything that's said. Mm. Okay. Um, right. Uh, last time I checked, this is from Sonia. Last time I checked, there there is at least a three-month period before you can get an appointment. Has this changed? I can answer that. It depends on what appointment you're looking for. Um, will there be a special setup for us to get a new card post 2020? Mm. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. Sorry. Um, so, the, the new card that was introduced on the 6th of July is the one that will now carry on between now and the end of 20, you know, from, from now on for anyone who falls within the scope of the withdrawal agreement. If you move to Spain, uh, from the 1st of January 2021, unless anything better is negotiated, you will be sub you will be treated as a third country national, and will be subjected to the subjected to the main um, foreigners law, which is uh, different to the one for EU nationals. I don't know the ins and outs of it, but it's a completely different set of requirements. Okay. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Michael. Uh, Richard, I was going to say regarding the appointments. Uh, yes. Yesterday we requested an appointment here in Armoria. For, to switch uh, from our normal residencia to a TIE, and we requested it yesterday, and the appointment's been given for tomorrow. So, at least here in Armoury, it seems that the, there is no problem with the appointments, at least at the moment. Yeah, Sarah, would you like to comment on that? Because I know that you've put out the information. Yeah, no, just to say that in Alicante province as well, there is lots of availability for people who wish to swap their document. Um, I think probably new applicants, um, wishing to apply in person will find that there is less availability um, and are being you know anyone who can apply online is being encouraged to do so but if you wish to swap there is a point there is availability from one day to the next in the Alicante province but it does the, the Valencia, Castellón and Murcia provinces don't have quite as much availability so it is a question of going on the website and looking on a regular basis. Thank you Sarah. I've got a, a question Sophie for you. Um, when buying a property in the UK, one has to have a survey carried out. Is this required or sensible to do in Spain? So surveys aren't generally done here in Spain, but we are seeing that more and more clients are getting in touch with architects over here and are now doing surveys on the property as well. But you know, generally speaking, I would say 90% of the sales that go through our offices don't have surveys done. It's not a requirement. Brilliant, thank you, Sophie. Uh, Ignacio, do you want to comment on that from the sort of legal perspective? Mm, yeah, um, I will. I will just add. I don't know whether Michael will be will be um, in the same opinion, but normally, depending on where the property is, if it's inland, I, I agree with Sophie. It's not a requirement, but it's very important. Even if you if you're try, trying to buy inland. I normally recommend when the lawyer checks whether the land registry clicks with the cadastro and then the reality of the square meters of the house, the, the pool, the, the land, et cetera, et cetera, we normally uh, recommend having independent um, valuers and surveyors because it's very accurate and especially in land, Richard, if you're talking about in the center of Alicante or, 
go in a city, probably that does not very quiet uh, and probably doesn't bring too much value, probably. I don't know if Michael would like to add anything on that. Yes, I agree with you totally. It's not, it's not as normal as in the UK, but sometimes it is, uh, it is convenient, especially if there's, a, there's doubts regarding the, the measurement of the property, that sometimes the, the title of the will just describe as 120 square metres in de- various rooms without going room by room, and the client can't work out whether really that is the measurement or not. It's good to have someone check it out, amongst other things, to make sure that there's no illegal extension. Yes, there is a question on that later, Michael. Good point. Um, from Phil, uh, there has also been a lot of conflicting information around taxation versus residentia. Because of the current financial markets, I will need to remain a UK taxpayer 21, 20, until 2122, as I need to take the 25% tax free lump sum to give the time for the markets to recover. So our plan was to spend just 180 days in Spain during 2021 to pay UK tax. But does this impact the residency application by the end of this year? Well, the answer I would think is yes. But um, uh, Sarah, do you want to answer that first? And then I'll go to you, Ignacio, about the tax. Yeah, so the only thing I would, I would say there, obviously I'm not, I'm not an expert on taxation at all, is that with reference to residency, if you are out of the country for more than six months um, and you've been resident for less than five years, you could lose your status. And we understand that the Spanish authorities will be doing more checks as people come in and out of the country from the beginning of next year. So it is a risk. Right. Thank you for that. That's yes, what I thought. Ignacio, do you want to comment on this tax? Yes. Because please. you can be, uh, just, just to clarify this, you can have um, residentia but you don't have to be fisc- fiscally resident, do you? But I don't know how that applies when we get to the TIE stage. Mm. Well, Richard, the situation here is a very is very delicate because the residentia is what it, it really puts on evidence, and you're telling the state that you're living here more as a resident. So, for the double taxation treaty, that's the key. If you're resident of this country in Spain now, obviously the tax is to pay in Spain. Now, the, 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 if you read the, the Double Taxation Treaty in Article 3, you will see, if people download it, will see that the, the address, the, what we call it, the domicile, or what we call the residency. Now, if you're saying on one hand that you're a resident with, with a proper card, let's call it a green card, or, mm. or just a TIE, uh, to be honest, it's, it, to me, is the same. Uh, and then you're saying that you're a non-taxpayer, I really think it could bring uh, 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 an issue in the future because, um, to be honest, I think they need to sit with their lawyer or tax advisor and then just do a plan to see how much impact is on the tax uh, and how much impact is having residentia. And because if we're talking about a lot of money, probably uh, I think um, I could even say, well, don't go for residentia now, do it later on. But uh, the problem is later on, um, we'll need to see what are the requirements. And then in a worst case scenario, what are the requirements in a worst case scenario for an American or a third country citizen? Do I meet with these requirements? So I really think they need to do a little bit of planning, proper and very well advised. Um, I don't know if Sarah or Michael wants to add anything here. Yeah, can we move on as quick as possible, Michael? Over to you, but uh, we've got lots of questions today. Okay, very quickly, what I would like to see, let's say, is what we're seeing a lot is, uh, from purely from a Brexit point of view, I can understand everyone wanting to suddenly become a resident, but uh, a lot of the people there are just becoming residents overnight now. They're not thinking about the tax implications, and a lot of them are, getting, are going to get themselves into a lot of very serious uh, uh, trouble uh, moving forward. Um, they, they, before becoming a tax resident in Spain, they should, uh, they should look very carefully into how it's going to affect their tax returns uh, here in Spain, because you may end up having both countries after your, after your after tax payments, especially if you sort of become a resident and next month you sell a property in the, in the UK, etc. Things are tending, people are doing things the wrong back to front at the moment, a lot because of the Brexit thing, and it's going to cause a lot of problems. Okay, thank you, Michael. Excellent. Um, from Estelle. Uh, I was told by the police officer who issued uh, the green residential card that after the 31st of December 2020, 
the current EU residence card needs to be changed for a third country residence card. That's not that's not correct. Uh, Zara, you said this is not the case. If it needs to be changed, will this be a straightforward exchange, providing ID is submitted together with the correct application, or will further criteria be needed? such as evidence of income, etc. I can answer that one very quickly and succinctly. It's a straight swap. You just take in the uh, necessary docu documentation and the forms and it's a straight swap. Um, thinking, uh, thinking of applying for Spanish nationality. I have Spanish university uh, qualifications, a PER skipper's license, so I do have the language and Spanish culture exam. Uh, yes, <laughs> it's not a question, it's a statement. Uh, uh, Sarah, are you saying we don't have to wait for three months just to show the correct amount of money that has sat in our bank accounts? We have everything else ready, Sarah. Um, I I think that um, sorry sorry about the background noise there. Uh, I'm we don't know exactly what the foreigners office are going to be looking at and whether they would take it before it's been there for three months. But the fact they've been sitting there for three months is a kind of anti fraud measure brought in by the police. Um, so if you wish to apply beforehand, there's nothing stopping you. Okay, brilliant. You know, if you get a rejection, they'll just tell you what the issue is. But if you can also choose to wait. Okay, um, from uh, Lewis, how long does one have to be in Spain before the end of 2020 to get a TIE? Theoretically, could one take an occupancy up on the 1st of December on a six month lease and still qualify? Yes, yeah, so anyone who arrives in Spain and is legally living in Spain before the end of this year can fall under the withdrawal agreement. The closer to the date you get, the more evidence you may be asked for to show that you're here, but yes. And you don't necessarily have to have obtained the document by the end of the year. If you have not been able to apply for it in time, if you can show why, or you can show that you've started the process, that should be sufficient. Okay, thank you, that, Sarah. Um, this one is for you, Martin. For an existing temporary, oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, bear with me. I am 58 years old and therefore 58 years old and therefore not in receipt of any pensions. Uh, I also don't work in Spain. I get my health care in Spain as my husband's dependent as he is in the Spanish system. He is a British pensioner but does not as yet have his S1. He hasn't applied for one because he's still technically working out here if he were to die and she says yes please anyway would any entitlement to spanish health care continue what would this situation be if he got his s1 in other words which route should they take i think that's the question martin All right okay so the entitlement to health care for this person is dependent on her husband um so in any situation whether it was because he was working sorry about the noise if it was because he was working or whether he was an s1 holder and the the widow would have a period of grace three months after that the title holder dies before she would have to find her own cover um so it's it's not a case of which option they choose really it's just doing what's the right option under the law and under the european union regulations so while her while her husband is still working she would remain dependent on him as a worker and when he becomes pensionable age um, he could apply for the UK S1 or he, it's possible as well he could also apply for a Spanish state pension by aggregating contributions because he would have been working for some years in Spain. Um, for the customer herself if she may have entitlement to health care in her own right if she is permanently resident here and has been here for five years. Okay, and if that is the case, then she can apply as a permanent resident of Spain, which I believe is something we're going to cover in the meeting on Monday. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Okay, um, moving on again. How, uh, would it be possible to apply for an S1 after December 31st? Again, it's yours, Martin. 
Uh, yeah, that's no problem whatsoever as long as the person is already resident here. Okay, so they, in order to apply for an S1 after December the 31st, they need to be in the scope of the withdrawal agreement, which means they need to be officially resident. And as long as that's the case, it doesn't matter what age they become state pensioners, they'll still be able to apply for an S1 in the future. Brilliant, thank you for that. Uh, for an appointment to submit EX20, do we go to the foreigner's office in Valencia or Alicante? We are moving to rural Valencia. That's a good, good one. Sarah, go ahead. Yeah, I would say it depends where you live now. I mean, presumably this person lives in the UK and is moving to rural Valencia. The first thing you do when you go on the online system to book an appointment is select the province. So this goes by province. You select the province. If you are moving to Valencia or you live in Valencia, you would select the Valencia province. And from there, as you select the option, you'll be given what availability there is, either in Valencia capital or other, or other towns where they also have that facility. I would imagine it would just be Valencia capital. But if you live in the Alicante province at the moment and are going to move to Valencia in the future, then you would apply now in, in Alicante and get your status in Alicante and then you could swap it to, uh, to change the address in the future if you move. So it depends a little bit on the background. Brilliant, thank you, Sarah. Um, this is a, a repeat, really, of another question, but I will put it. So if you have the old A4 Residencia, should you trade it in for the TIE card soon, now, or wait for after the withdrawal? In, yeah, entirely up to you. Yeah, simple answer. Uh, but there are, uh, vacancies at the moment in Alicante, um, yes. so it is possible to do it without too much hassle at the yes. moment. The Spanish authorities have put resource in a lot of different police stations for this process. That resource may not last forever, but you know you will always be able to do it. Just might wait for longer for an appointment in the future. Right. Next question from Richard. In 2020, it looks like I will be in Spain for longer than 183 days due to not being able to travel for my work. I am married to a Spanish national and have a Spanish daughter. I work for a UK employer and am paid into UK account. Currently, I pay 100% tax in the UK, but not sure if I will need to pay tax in Spain or declare my taxes here this year. Ignacio, yours. Yeah, this is, uh, thank you, Richard. This is, a, it will be a hard one um, to answer, but just plain to common sense here, what is being the state of alarm, everything stopped in Spain for a certain amount of time. So if you could always prove that you're a fiscal resident in the UK and you've been because of the lockdown in Spain, um, I think they will, they will have a good evidence to, to say that he's really a fiscal resident, but he couldn't leave the country. Uh, that will be my interpretation, but I agree that it will be a delicate subject and I will recommend him to, to um, furnish himself with a lot of evidence like a certificate. I always recommend to have a certificate uh, from the UK Inland Revenue saying according to the Double Taxation Treaty uh, between Spain and the UK, you are a taxpayer in the UK. Now that's very useful, Rita, document that we, we use it in the past uh, with all these letters that tax office sent to clients. Uh, because once the administration sees the other administration uh, has already confirmed a situation, they stop and normally they close the case. So here is a good, a good uh, um, advice for you, Richard, on Facebook. Thank you very much. Michael, did you want to come in on that from an attack perspective? Uh, no, no, I'm just waiting to make my question to Sarah when everyone <laughs> finishes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I plan to... Uh, yes, I plan to swap my residence here to TIE. I've been living in Spain for 20 years, so I have accrued rights. How will my TIE show that as against a new arrival's TIE? Uh, my understanding is it's under observation, but Sarah. Right, I don't know whether it will say on the TIE when you first moved to Spain, because I haven't seen a finished TIE yet, but I would imagine it will. If not, don't worry, it remains on their database and it will say that you are a beneficiary of the withdrawal agreement. So that's the important thing. That's the uh, Article 18.4, is it? Article 18 point something, yes. Okay. Uh, uh, from Ross, uh, I have 
Residencia, which I received in January this year. I came back to the UK in February to sell my house and I've been stuck here because of the pandemic. When I return, hopefully in September, I will move to another house that I'm buying. Will my residency still be valid? I can answer that. No, because really you need to change your address. And will it be a simple transfer to TIE to show my new address or will I need to go back to the beginning? It's a simple transfer. So that's that question answered. Um, I have a green credit sized residencia certificate. I will have completed five years in December from the date of issue of the card. There is some confusion about the TIE card being valid for either five or 10 years. Which one will I be eligible for? Well, if you do it after December, uh, you'll be eligible for the uh, 10 year one. If you do it before, you, I'm afraid, will be eligible for the five year one because you are still temporary. We can't get to Spain until the 20th of August and complete our house purchase on the 24th of August. How soon can we apply for residency? Do we have to wait for three months? Sarah, Ignacio, Sarah. Yeah, so um, I would say you don't have to wait for three months. The instructions are that you should apply within three months. So it does not say you have to wait for three months. What you could do um, is start gathering evidence to prepare your application. So you're going to buy a property. If you've got a bank account, you could move some money into it, etc., to be ready to make the application and have that evidence ready. Thank you, Sarah. Um, from Kim. Would you advise to go to the TIE appointment when exchanging your green residency card with someone fluent in Spanish? Um, Helen and I did this on Friday uh, in Alicante, and my answer would be that providing you've got a reasonable level of Spanish, a smattering of Spanish, if you like, no, it's not necessary. The process is very simple. They're very helpful. Uh, that would be my view. Does anybody want to comment on it? No, okay. Um, I'm thinking of transferring my business from UK to Spain and pay my taxes in Spain. Obviously, what I would need to do, obviously, what would I need to do to set up my business in Spain? That's, that's a complex question. Ignacio, I'm gonna put it to you for a quick answer, please. Yeah, well, a quick answer to say they will need to seek independent legal advice, uh, but obviously they need to start the whole process. Uh, they need to um, get their NI numbers, their residencia, um, open a bank account, uh, appoint an accountant, um, and start trading, and then inform the UK in, in the UK that they're going to become non resident over there and start it here. But they really need to do it properly and plan it well in advance. So that will be my, my quick answer, Richard. Okay, yeah, obviously. Um, from Lewis again, I am surprised that applying for a green card implies that you were tax resident in Spain. As I understood it, Spanish law requires you to apply for a green card if you intend to reside for more than three months, not six months. Sarah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the understanding, the Spanish law is referring to people who are moving to Spain and it refers to applying within three months of arriving. So anyone who's going to be there for three months or longer with the intention of remaining is the, the understanding behind that. It doesn't really take into account the people who spend five months a year here and then seven months in the UK, for example. Um, those people can apply for residency if they want to, but they're going to be doing a lot of toing and froing of applying and unapplying. And when we've discussed this with the Spanish authorities, they have agreed that the logical thing would be for those people not to apply for residency. Okay, thank you, Tara. Um, Sophie, this one's in your court again, but Ignacio may want to pick up on it or uh, Michael as well. Um, was the property that uh, I'm looking at buying, how do I know it was built with planning permission that all subsequent uh, work done on it was legal and uh, um, a declaration de obra and away, nuevo uh, was there? And uh, that doesn't mean the person says that it's necessarily legal. It just means it's been registered. Um, so when people come to you to look at a property, uh, what checks are done? 
Okay, so when we actually go to list the property, we will check all the, all the documentation ourselves. And, you know, we're not solicitors. We don't know the law inside out like an ATO does. But we know enough to see if there's any red flags. We'll check. If we think that there's anything untoward, we will always send those documents over to an independent solicitor to check them through. And we will make sure that everything is in order before we even list the property. So, I mean, if you're coming to us, we've already done the pre preliminary checks for you. But then we would all, always insist that your solicitor checks it all through again. But really, you should have a solicitor when you're thinking of coming over to Spain to buy a property, have somebody in place ready to go. So if you see that property, you can get straight in touch with them and they can start making all those checks for you. Brilliant. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, Ignacio, Michael, do you wish to come in? Michael, would you like to go ahead? Yeah, that's fine. Um, obviously, this is a question uh, that, 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 that this, uh, this person should not try and resolve herself. She should get the solicitor that's handed the conveyance to look into her particular case. Uh, whether the, a property can be on a title B and be completely legal, and yet it could have been built without a building license, because there are different ways in which a property can be made legal. The main one, which is one that one would expect, is the building license, the end of work, and then you access the, the, the title B, the registrar. You can also legalize things by antiquity, very old, old properties, and through a procedure called AFO here in Andalusia. AFOs do impose future limits on different constructions that you can do on the house from that moment on. So, but basically, if this is something that their solicitor will look into for them, and uh, basically that's what they have to do: find a good solicitor and, and put themselves in their hands. Brilliant, thank you, Michael. Um, from Octavia. I'm looking to start a new business in Spain in 2021, but want to get the ball rolling now. I have an E number and own a property there. Obviously, they're in the UK at the moment, but I'm not resident. What's your best advice? And am I best acting now, pre-December 31st or after? Ah, deathly hush. Go ahead, Sarah. Right, so I can't comment on anything to do with the business. I would suggest, as others have before, to seek independent legal and financial advice about anything to do with business ventures. The only thing I will say is that if you wish to be within the scope of the withdrawal agreement, which does bring a lot of different rights with, you, with it, you would need to be living here legally before the end of this year. Um, and you can find a lot of that information on the gov.uk website. So, you know, have a look through. All the information is on there about the things that are covered regarding healthcare cover, um, access to healthcare, residency rights, rights to bring family members, etc. cetera. Um, and if you're not fussed about that, then you can wait. Okay, thank you, uh, Jared. Anybody else? Uh, Ignacio, Michael, do you wish to come in? No, okay. Um, quick, quick one then, very quick one, which I'll answer. Will the TIE card have a photo? The answer is yes. When you go to get your photo done, I suggest you use a photographer and ensure that you ask for a photo suitable for a Spanish identity card. They are not the same size as British passport photos. Um, oh, oh, good one, this. What are the inheritance rules for a Spanish resident Resign, res, Spanish resident resigning inheritance from a UK family. I think that means getting. What are the Spanish inheritance rules for a Spanish resident getting, receiving, receiving inheritance from a UK family? Okay. Uh, Go ahead, Michael. Can you hear, can you hear it? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so it's a, we're talking about a family that's resident here in Spain, receiving an inheritance from abroad. Yes. Yeah, from a UK family. Okay. If they're if they're residents, they have they don't have to go to probate in Spain, obviously, because that will happen over in the UK, whatever kind of country the assets are being, uh, where it's been dealt with. But they will have to declare what they're receiving to the Spanish inheritance tax office, and they will have to re have to declare it to the regional government where they are residents. So if they are residents in Andalusia, they'd have to declare whatever they receive on that estate in the UK, for example, 100,000 euro or whatever, they have to declare it to the inheritance tax office in Andalusia. And, in this, and, in, and depending on their, their relationship with the deceased, they will have a higher or lower exemption, which changes from one region to the next. But they do have to declare it in Spain. 
as an inherit okay. uh, on the inheritance tax forms. Right, and that's under the standard inheritance levels that are in Spain. No, 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 no. As they are resident, they 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 say that they are residents in Spain, so they will be resident in a particular region. Uh, yeah. It's it's where they're resident that will determine which exemptions they're allowed, because they will apply the exemptions. Yeah, that's what I mean. In that particular region. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Uh, when you say main to maintain residency in Spain, and you cannot be out of the country for more than six months. Please, can you confirm that you can leave the country any number of times as long as you return within six months? Yeah, that, that's correct. Um, so, the whilst you, sort of the first five years of living in Spain, if you want to be within the scope of the withdrawal agreement, um, absences of over six months could affect that right. After you've been resident for five years, um, it's far more flexible. Okay, so then you're kind of permanent. What I would suggest again is to read through the frequently asked questions document um, that I'm sure Richard can share again at the end of this event, the link, because the link is very long, um, but mm -hmm. it's all in there about how long you can be absent for um, in the different scenarios. Yeah, it's also up on the Brexpats in Spain site if you care to join us, so um, it, it's available there. Uh, as we still have a green card, but invalid because we've been out of the country for more than six months. Do we have to do anything formal to cancel the green card before applying for a TIE? Right, okay. Uh, I'm going to answer this one because I think that person has misunderstood me. At the moment, the Spanish authorities are not really checking whether British people are here for more than six months or not. Okay. The, what I'm referring to is after we leave, after the end of the transition period, there will be more checks and people's statuses could be affected, okay? So the fact that you've been out of the country for more than six months will only affect your residency status at the moment if the Spanish authorities happen to have done a spot check, which I don't think they do particularly often, okay? Having said that, if you've got any concerns, you can take your residency certificate along to apply for a TIE and you'll be probably get a straight swap and it should be straightforward and no problem. Okay. Um, Kim is asking if we can post a link for booking an exchange for TIE in Alicante. As I understand it, that's posted up on the Gov website. Uh, yeah. Living in Spain? Okay. The person should go to the Frequently Asked Questions document, select the, the, the criteria that's relevant for them and book their appointment through the link on the Frequently Asked Questions document. It's also available in Brexpats in Spain if you care to join there. Um, Will, uh, again from Sonia, will a TIE have to be renewed every five years? Or if nothing changes, is that it? Right, now that, very quickly, if you have residencia temporada, you're going to have to uh, renew it after five years. If you have permanent residence, it's 10 years. And now I'm going to pass it over to um, Ignacio for what the standard TIE system is. Uh, sorry, Rita, what do you mean? What were you now? Uh... What are the renewal periods for the standard TIE? So, oh, in, any, oh, in other oh, words, oh, somebody oh, getting a TIE card who well, has a transfer card. You get the residency card for one year, then you renew two years, then two years, and then five. That's for third country nationals, right? Here, with regards to the TIE, with the withdrawal agreement, is they're giving now five years and 10 years. So it's a special regime that what they're doing with the, with the British. Okay, thank you, Ignacio. Um, the next question. Post uh, the transition period, how much is a TIE going to cost a new applicant? Does anybody want to pick that up? I think it's the same, exactly the same amount of money, 12 euros, I think, isn't it, Sarah? No, yeah. a TIE. Is, no, I think what, what you're referring to there is the requirements. So how much money do you need in the bank as a third country national to be entitled to apply for a TIE? The TIE itself is very cheap. Mm. That's not the issue. It's how to get it. And as a third country national, the income requirements and the healthcare requirements, etc., are higher, of course. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what they are, but they, it's higher. I don't know whether Ignacio has more yeah. detail about that. I, I could just tell you now that we're doing for Americans or, or, or Canadian or third country citizens, uh, one person uh, will be 26,000 euros, and I believe two person, I think, is 33. Uh, 
Um, so is is 2,140 euros, I think, the first person uh, in the bank per month, okay? So uh, is a completely different uh, requirement, Richard. Is much more money. Okay. Um, I understand that there are still discussions going on that may affect this figure. Uh, Sarah, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, so the only thing I would say there is that um, obviously everything from January the 1st, 2021 is still up for negotiation. Um, so the default is the kind of general regime for third country nationals, unless something better is negotiated between the UK and Spain or the UK and the EU. Thank you very much. I under uh, this question, uh, I'm going to put it, but it's really, I think, Almeria region. Uh, more than Alicante or Valencia. Um, somebody has said they have heard scare stories of people having their houses knocked down or buildings on the property knocked down. Um, I'll put it to you, Michael. Well, recently, or, or, or there's been no, no properties, to, to my knowledge, there's been no properties being knocked down uh, recently. There was a, a famous Priors case about 15 years ago and uh, there's been a few sort of half-built properties up in the Amanzora Valley, but I haven't heard of any recent, uh, any recent concern. Uh, there, are, there are lots of properties that are still illegal and they haven't managed to legalise yet, but they're sort of living in, in limbo at the moment. There's no, no action one way or the other. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, and Sophie, the final question uh, it comes to you. Um, what are the costs in selling a property? And what are the costs in buying a property? I think they're looking for a percentage or a general figure. So here in the Alicante region, if you're buying a property, you're going to have approximately 13% taxes on top of the purchase price, 10% VAT, EVA, and then the 3% for your land registry and notary costs. Plus you would then have your solicitor's fee, which is generally speaking between 1,200 and 1,500 euros. If you're looking to sell, then you would have your agent's commission. You would also have a tax called the plus valia tax, which is given to you from the sumer office. And that's based on your property and how long you've lived there. You would also have, if you're a non-resident, you would have the non-residency tax deductible as well. But if you're a fiscal resident, then that wouldn't apply. So it does differ. You would also have to make sure that all your certificates, like your energy certificate and habitation certificate, are all up to date, and if not, also cover the costings for them as well. Thank you, Sophie. Um, the next part of the question, I don't know whether it's going to be you or Ignacio, but uh, Stan says, uh, if he is buying a new house and continuing to live in Spain, does that negate any of the taxes? As far as I'm aware, no. Ignacio? Say it again, Richard. I couldn't hear. If, if somebody is selling an existing property in Spain, but the money from that property is being put into another property in Spain, i.e. they're continuing to live here, uh, does it negate any of the taxes? You're talking about capital gain tax? Yeah, well, I assume so. Any. I think, sorry, I think he's talking about but, if he... If he sells the property, we're talking about capital, buys gains, capital, again. capital gains tax. Capital gains yeah, tax. I think that's capital what it gains, is. Right? Okay. Right. And well, exemption for reinvestment. Mm. Yeah, capital gain tax. Uh, if they are over sixty-five and the resident in Spain, um, the selling one property and investing to another one is is exempt. Okay. Now, if you're below sixty-five, even reinvesting as well uh, into a new property is exempt. Now, if it's a second property then it accrues capital gain tax, Richard. Now uh, the tax is 19, 21 and 23 on the profit. It's very important to understand whether they're selling the main property or not. Okay, okay. and whether they're raising it or not is important. Thank, thank you, Ignacio. Michael, you wanted to ask Sarah a question. We've got three minutes. <sighs> okay, Sarah, I'm a, as you know, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer here in Andalusia. I'm very confused still about the TIE. And the first thing I'm confused about is uh, uh, I'm not what it's, like. it's almost as if at the moment it's sort of voluntary to ch exchange your green card for the TIE, but is it obligatory after the 1st of January or not then, or not obligatory either after the 1st yeah. of January? The Spanish authorities have said that 
it is voluntary and it will remain voluntary. Okay, so why, this is what I, I mean, this is the question that we're going to have all the time now, of course, is people are going yep. to say, okay, well, it's voluntary, well, should I do it or not? What do I do? Do I do it? Exactly. Do I... So people are going to have to make their own decision. We are not going to tell people what to do there, okay? The Spanish authorities have said that either document is valid to prove that you will fall under the withdrawal agreement. A4 residency certificate, small residency card, or a TIE, whether it's permanent or not. They have said that all three documents are valid to show that you fall under the withdrawal agreement. The advantages of taking out a TIE is that it is photo ID, it is clear, it's simple to use, um, you don't need to carry your passport around with you and things like that. The disadvantage yeah. is that every 10 years you will need to go and renew it. Mm -hmm. um, your status will not be affected by whether or not or not you renew it, but the validity of the card is. So if you take the example of someone who has a driving license, if they don't renew their driving license, they're still, they, they still, they don't need to redo their test, but they can't drive until they've got a new driving license. So if you have a TIE for 10 years and it expires and you don't renew it, your status hasn't changed, you're still full within the withdrawal agreement, but when you have to show it, you don't have anything that can show it and you need to go and renew it. So you, you, know, you are forced to renew it eventually. So that's okay. the disadvantage is obviously, every 10 years that trip to the police station to do it all over again so thank it's entirely up to each individual what they want to do thank, thank you, you Sharon. and um we are now just coming up to um finish um thank you all for joining the panel i'm sorry we had so many questions there isn't time to pass it round for you all to uh, give a brief synopsis of what you wanted to say but thank you and i'm sure the people who ask the questions and those who watch this are grateful for the information that you have provided. Brexpats in Spain is available to everybody. It's free to join. Uh, we have 15,000 members now in Spain and we try and help everybody in any way that we can. To Sarah, thank you uh, specifically for the consulate input and Martin from the embassy. Uh, thank you for your input on health. Uh, to Michael, thank you for your useful legal advice as always. Sophie, excellent. Uh, this is the first time we brought property into it and we had seven questions. So obviously uh, there is something that people want to know about the property situation and I suspect that will increase as time goes on. And finally to Ignacio, thank you. Uh, thank you for your support for Brexpats in Spain and thank you for arranging this um, Zoom meeting for us. I'm now going to close the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.